Um, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so that's always the first good question to ask at a thing like, like this, right? Um, so the new data imperative. Um, I, I've been, I've prepared something that I'm going to talk through, but at the same time I've been listening to the programs from this morning, what Rem and Sean said and then what Evan said in his session, and I've heard a lot of stuff about like, you know, the technical aspects of pulling together data and what kind of tools to use and what's your database and what's your, you know, what, what do you, you know, how can you use tools to manipulate the data? Well, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot that goes behind that. And I'm hoping to, you know, get through that today and talk through how your staff can kind of collaborate and come together and what it means to actually pull, t pull data together to create a database. So, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna be walking back and forth because I have to hit the arrow key. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was this movie that came out a couple of years ago called Moneyball. <laughs> I don't know if you all remember this movie or not, but um, the premise is that this, you know, sort of terrible dying, oh, thank you. Sean is giving me his remote. <laughs> So nice of you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so you know, there's this this team that was lagging behind in Oakland, and they had a couple of star players. Well, those star players got you know taken away, and that meant their budget got reduced. And so this guy, Billy Bean, ran into this other guy, Peter Brand, who had this whole system for pulling together data on players so that they could maximize their budgets. And so when they, you know, kind of went through this process of, of maximizing, basically what they wanted to do is get hits, because hits mean runs. And once, the, um, once they kind of uh, got this formula down, they ended up with a winning team. And the reason they ended up with a winning team is because they had all of these great players who had you know, one or two things that they could do really well. Well, when you take that and combine it with another player who could do something else really well, you get hits. So they, um, and now this standard for baseball is, you know, it's, it's an industry standard. Everyone does this now in order to maximize their budgets, in order to maximize getting hits. So it seems like it's a principle that can be applied to the nonprofit, right? I mean, who doesn't want to get hits? So I thought I would start with that example because it kind of, you know, pulls it all together for everyone. Oh, right, I have this. <laughs> Except it's not working. Sorry, no. <laughs> I had to pair it. <laughs> Getting on base, you're right. Exactly. exactly. Yes, because you can you can get on base by getting a walk. Okay. Thank you. That was very. Oh, no, it's a good. <laughs> Got to correct the uh, the analogy. So um, one of the things that we have seen very much in the last several years, and Deborah is going to be talking about this in the other room, uh, in terms of social media, is that the amount of data people collect. It's just, you know, it's sort of unbelievable. You know, ha everyone wants to collect the five addresses that a person has, or the six email addresses, or the four phone numbers. And we all, ourselves, personally, are collecting our own, you know, just huge amounts of data. So there's been this giant data growth over the last, you know, several years that now people have to manage, collect, understand, and use in some way or another. We've seen it across the board. We've, you know, we, I have two phone numbers because I have a Google Voice number and I have a regular cell phone number. I have five email addresses. I have, you know, so where do I put my own stuff? You know, it kind of translates into where does the nonprofit or where does the, you know, small business, where do they store all of your stuff so they can always contact you? And then how do they identify what the best place is to contact you? Is it on Twitter? Is it, you know, 
do, are there people that are texters and people that are phone, you know, people that want to get a phone call? Anyway, it's a big issue that I think everyone is kind of dealing with these days. And if you're sitting in your office at your nonprofit and you're like, well, I've got all these phone numbers. Where do I, who do I call? Do I fax them? No. You know, that's kind of old school. Anyway, um, the, the point is that we are in this crazy situation where we, right, I have this. I keep walking up there. Um, we're in this crazy situation now where we just, you know, is, can we go further? Of course. There's always going to be more data to collect and, you know, kind of aggregate. So in nonprofit specifically, donor and advocacy, I think, is one of the, the places where, um, where we are we're learning to mine areas of interest. You know, a donor can make a donation to your organization, but does that mean that they also want to volunteer? Does that mean that they, you know, might be interested in helping out with a phone bank? Does that mean that they're interested in, you know, helping organize a community activity? So in, in some ways, nonprofits are collecting information and they're now just starting to be able to understand how to use it and what to do with it. So again, I'm gonna bring this, I'm gonna bring it all around eventually, but you know, it's nonprofits are, are overwhelmed and taxed right now with having to collect and, and figure out what to do with all this stuff. Um, so this brings us to, of course, data is really hot right now. And data is hot right now because the technology behind the technology is that can be um, there is technology now that can be maximized to use it in a more productive and, um, and kind of a, um, open way. Um, your leaders and your board members are looking for you to produce numbers all the time. They're looking for you to say, well, you know, on uh, September 15th, we raised $500,000. Okay, well, where is that $500,000 gonna go? Is it gonna actually maximize my program? What's it gonna do? So um, what you have to do is start to be able to manipulate and manage that data in a way that, um, that makes a lot of sense. We, um, a couple months ago, we came across an organization that is a housing organization, very similar to what Sean and Rem um, were talking about this morning that um, I can't say their name because we're still in the midst of a project with them. Um, but what they had in their office of like 20 or 30 people was a database that they had to use to report to state, a database, an access database that they were using in one department, a bunch of spreadsheets in another department, a bunch of, I mean literally a bunch of spreadsheets. There, this one department was using a 20 tab spreadsheet to track their information. It was all like, they had things that were all relating back to one another, but if somebody just like put the wrong thing in the wrong cell, it messed up the entire thing. Um, and they also had Outlook and email and all sorts of things. And so what we, what we said was, you need a renovation. You need a full data renovation. So we have started very slowly with them to address some of their technical challenges which were this array of separate databases, databases and lists. And they had, you know, they couldn't track and leverage their key community relationships. What they wanted to do in their community was to uh, um, create leaders. They wanted to identify people that they were working with that could become community leaders because they knew that the only way to kind of get their message across, to maybe get new donors, to get people more involved with their programs, was to identify their neighbors and say, hey, you know, you're a really interesting person in your community, everyone respects you, why don't you come and help us? They had no way of tracking who these people were. Now the way that they got to deciding, oh, we need a leadership program, they created a logic model. They hired a consultant who came in and, you know, kind of worked through some things with them. Does everyone know what a logic model is? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'll move on. Um, so what they, um, 
what they did was they had this you know, array of Excel spreadsheets. I'm going to just take this one department that we're working with as, a, as sort of part of this case study. Um, they had this 20-tab this spreadsheet. They would put things into it, and then in order to get one little report, it would take one employee two and a half days to just get the one dashboard report that the boss wanted. And so they would, in advance, you know, plan out that they knew the boss wanted the report on September 15th, and they would devote their two and a half days to getting that report done. And it would happen, but it would, you know, always fraught with issues and, um, and problems. I'm sure none of you have come across this ever, right? Um, so we decided when we first started working with them that this department was the first and you know most interesting one of the group because they were um, they were sort of a tight department as it was, but they were siloed from the rest of the organization. And so we um, we sat down with them and we were like, well, you got to show us everything because we have to understand how you want to how you want to track things, how you want to um, how you want to who who's who's in these spreadsheets. Unpack them for us. And so it took a lot of like prodding and probing to get them to sort of understand that the more we understood about their organization, the more better their new database was going to be. So these were the, this was the technical challenge, and this was part of their, just a little part of their wish list, which was to take all of those disparate crazy spreadsheets, put it into something that could be cloud-based because they, travel around to community meetings. They need stuff on their phone. They need to, you know, if a, if a community member comes in, they want to be able to track that they attended an event. So that was a really big part of their wish list. Well, okay, how do you take this, like, 20-page spreadsheet and put it into something that they could then track? Um, and it took a long time for them to tell us that they were, that they traveled around in their community for some reason. That, that was... It was, um, we asked the question if they needed mobile access, but the question wasn't really, if, if you ask someone if they need mobile access, they might say no, because they might think it's really expensive, but once we sort of understood that they were, you know, that they were in their cars and they were attending community meetings, we suggested to them, seems like you need something that is mobile. Um, that two and a half days of time that it took for that employee, that really needed to go because, you know, two and a half days is a lot of time wasted, especially in a nonprofit that is very overwhelmed and overtaxed and has too many responsibilities as it is. Um, data security and protection. One of the things that we realized with them after we went through a, um, a, a, a process of creating user stories was that we began to understand that they deal with sensitive information. And it's not just sensitive information like you know your credit card numbers or your social security numbers. It was health information and you know information that kind of related to who the residents were that they were dealing with. So security, privacy, user permissions was a really um, a big piece of what we had to work with them on. Um, so cut down on user error. Remember that you know if you put the wrong number in the in the spreadsheet, you mess the whole thing up. They needed to be able to make mistakes without it messing up the whole thing, because everyone makes mistakes, right? You have to have a way of like having some checks and balances. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but you get the idea. This was a department that was in deep trouble. Um, so what we did was we, you know, kind of went through that wish list, and we got an understanding of the change that they needed, which we can all surmise now, you know, they needed something that was going to actually house and manage their data that could end up being usable. In addition to that, they have this boss who was like, I just want to see everything on this one page. And, you know, the people that we're working with in this department are like, I don't know how to put it all on one page. You know, they're dealing with events and housing and um, all kinds of things. So how do you, how do you start the process? What do you do to kind of take everything that's in, you know, these disparate locations and pull it together? So I already talked about a logic model. You guys know what that is. Um, uh, so review what you have. That's a really, um, it, 
when we sat down with them, there were about five or six of them in this one department, when we sat down with them to start looking at all of the various things that they had, they realized that there were like three or four spreadsheets that they were maintaining that didn't actually have any information in that they were using. So we just ignored that for now. Um, just because, you know, why you continue, it's like that, um, you know, that saying, if it's been hanging in your closet for two years and you haven't used it, get rid of it, right? So the first way to sort of get through this process is to, um, you know, see if there's something you can just get rid of. Um, create user stories. I just mentioned this. Um, this is, it's, it's kind of a web development um, thing. You know, people create user stories based on how people are going to use their websites. Well, do that for your database, too, because the, the, it, was, it was really powerful for that, for this department. They, um, they created, I asked them to create five, they created 20. <laughs> and we were able to very um, nicely go through these user stories and realize what they needed in addition to their spreadsheets was a case management system. Not something that they'd ever thought about, but it was something that ended up being very powerful. They do financial counseling and they do, um, they help their constituents um, you know, get into affordable housing and they, they just, they had a lot of great processes and it was, you could tell that they're helping people, but they were not really, they were tracking it. Word documents and tracking, they didn't even realize that that could be part of this. So, um, so it was a really interesting way to, for me to learn more about who the people are that they're serving and for them to understand how better they could be serving the, the people that they're working with. So then, um, what types of reports? So I've already mentioned that the boss wanted this one page dashboardy report. Um, it turns out they themselves produce tons of reports. And generally, I'm sure you guys have been through this before, you know, if you can, if you can figure out what you want to track, you can then backtrack, or as we say, reverse engineer from your report back to where you go. Like, if you need to get a report of how many women lived at a certain um, address and were unemployed, well, you know, there, there could be a great report on that, but how do you get there? What's the tracking? You know, do you you go out and talk to people and ask them if they're employed or unemployed? Is there some sort of form? Is there a survey? Is there a phone call? You know, like what's the process to get there? So it's, it's really good, especially if you're working with a consultant, you know, give them everything <laughs> because they can better help, un they can understand better how to, um, to help you get what you want in the end. Um, so leads me to what reports do you need, which is probably one of the most critical things that, um, that nonprofits are having to deal with these days. You are, you're, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, your, your board members are looking to understand what the numbers are. Your funders, you know, are increasingly wanting to know what the effectiveness is of your, of your programs, so you're having to track outcomes. Well, what does that mean exactly? And how do you produce progress reports? So um, actually, Rem and Sean talked about outcomes measurement this morning in a very sort of broad technical way, which was a good basis for, you know, figuring that out. But how, is, as an organization, what kind of tool do you use? So there are, you know, a couple different ways to talk about tools. There's an outcomes measurement tool, which many folks adapt. It could be a survey. It could be a, um, you know, a membership. It could be a, uh, you know, a, um, you know, a form that you have somebody fill out, something like that. But then how do you take that and systematize it so that you can then report on it? And part of, part of doing that is breaking it down. Okay, I wanna find out how many women are living in this place that are unemployed. Okay, well, now I need a collection tool and then I need to be able to put that collection tool, you know, that da data somewhere. Some of this isn't automated. It's not possible to automate it. Um, because not everything can be automated. So you still have to figure out a depository. Um, so dashboards for the internal leadership. This one page report would be something that this, you know, boss really liked and that's all they need. Um, but that department will scramble to get it. <laughs> um, and then tasks reminders. Um, you know, everyone is talking about how uh, 
new technology can actually track things that you have to get done on a, on a regular basis. And, um, and so being able to track tasks should be easy. But what are those tasks related to? Anyway, um, I can see this is kind of, uh, I don't know. Um, data can be boring, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, oh man, so working down the data chain. So with this de department, this five or six individuals that I worked with on this one project, um, it, was, uh, it was kind of amazing because they had a logic model. They had, a, they had the outcome, which was this leadership matrix that they were supposed to fill out, but they were they kind of, they, they had to work really hard to get to actually being able to come up with the things that they collected. So, you know, through the process of uh, several meetings and them finally having some internal meetings, they decided that they needed to track events that people attended to, whether people spoke up at events. Um, they needed to figure out whether those people lived in the buildings that they serve, whether those people were having, you know, issues outside of housing. They had to, um, you know, they had to kind of dig into who the people were, and then they could come up with these measures of, um, of information that they could, that they could start to track. And so once they, once they kind of started breaking it down by actually serving the people, they were able to adequately track. And we started sort of with a spreadsheet. They were able to adequately track you know, what they needed to be able to systematize and then report on. And so, um, you know, outcomes, everyone, you know, outcomes is a big <laughs> category. Outcomes can be, you know, we serve 500 people, um, 25 meals over the course of three months. That could be an outcome. Um, but an outcome could also be our program made it possible for 50 youth to graduate from high school. Um, so getting to what those exact outcomes are is a very, you know, you have to work really hard at it. And I think what I'm trying to get to is that it's not only the, the data consultants that kind of have to push you, but the internal, you know, your internal group has to say to yourselves, like, okay, well, is it realistic for us to track all of these things? In theory, we want to be able to track that 50 kids graduated from high school. But what's the what's the realistic expectation that we have, or that we can ha um, use in order to get there? Like, what are the you know? Let's come up with ten things that make sense for us to track in order to understand how many kids are graduating from high school. And so there's there's this um, uh, you know interesting sort of. I, I think that there's a lot of theoretical um, work that goes into creating what these outcomes are. But then pragmatically applying them is a very uh, it's a it's it's a difficult process. Has anyone come across that situation? Like you, your boss says you have to yes. Exactly. And along the way, there's lots of little indicators that tell you whether you're making progress, but that those are the things that the people are doing the work to help measure that. Yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately, I didn't hand you the mic that got recorded, so your wonderful comment didn't get recorded. Um, but uh, basically, what you're saying is that um, you think that it's uh, um, outcome outcomes measurement starts much earlier than people imagine, and that it's difficult to get to the actual outcome that you want to manage. Is that yeah. basically? Maybe a, maybe a more concrete example would be employment programs in communities. Yeah. Brokers, you know, you know, turn out to be that people think that they're going to help people get employment, but they are often employed for cash out. So the people who come to, to get those services are often homeless or at risk of being homeless, or they're, they have maybe substance abuse problems. Or yep. Nowhere near prepared for those jobs, so you've got to have outcomes that have to do 
Yes. Yeah, very true. But then how do you take that? How do you take that whole concept, that whole like, you know, information pathway and systematize it and make it into something that is actually reportable? It's a it's a hard process. Yeah. <laughs> so so then, you know, um, you have to come up with an action model of um, actually being able to track that data. And in this case, when you're talking about tracking, you know, students from, you know, young age up to high school, what's the, what are the different moments where you want to track them? Um, and sometimes you talk about a theory of change and whether that is something that is um, a reliable measure of your effectiveness. Um, so I'm going to move on to this, which is <laughs> the sort of um, secret that um, secret all the secret spreadsheets that everyone has in their offices, which you all know that you have them, every single one of you. Of you. Um, there are the Outlook, you know, notes that you take. There are the um, the quick little like I'm gonna just add up all the people that went to this event and put it and save it somewhere in my hard drive. I'm going to um, I'm gonna you know put things on my little sticky notes on my desktop. Um, you know, how do you how do you kind of get out of your the people that you're working with that maybe that stuff is valuable maybe that information could be put somewhere that would be really helpful to everyone. So in this particular case with these five or six employees and this, these 20, this 20 tab spreadsheet, um, what was vital was that the person who was the head of the department basically did everything in her outlook and didn't share anything with anyone, not because she didn't want to or because she didn't share, but because she was so busy that she just didn't have time to say, you know, hey, there's this thing in my Outlook, and you know, you should check it out. Or she didn't even have time to forward emails or anything like that. So, so one of the, you know, they gave us this 20 tab spreadsheet, but then we had one full-on session, like three-hour session, just with her, to figure out exactly what she was doing on a daily basis. She was emailing, she was texting, she was calling people, she was visiting people, she was running off to meetings, she was doing all kinds of things and collecting all kinds of data that, that, they, that her employees didn't even know about. And that is, I'm sure, an issue that many, many people come up with. You know, how do you kind of track that? How do you get somebody who's so independent and so, you know, really um, wants to, um, wants to do their job really well that they forget to report in. Well, in this particular case, sitting her down for that three hours, which was really difficult to schedule, was the most important thing because she got it. Once she understood that she, she was, ex sorry, <laughs> once she understood that she was explaining her daily life to her employees and they were all like, huh, I didn't know that, it was, probably one of the more valuable things for her to understand because from then on she bought into the process of actually working through what the system could be and how it could change her life as well as theirs. Now she could go on vacation and not worry about her department not knowing everything that she had going on because of the way that they communicated and the way that they started tracking things. And it was, it was probably the most valuable thing. From that moment on, she was like, okay, we're gonna have Friday afternoon data sessions where we go through everything that got tracked, we go through everything that we're gonna track for the following week, and she actually started being the inspiration behind some deeper you know, information gathering by her employees. Her employees weren't like, oh, we're, you know, we're not on our own here. Our boss actually like, okay, cool. So it was, it was a very valuable moment for them for us, it was great because now we had this, you know, sort of seriously captive um, group of people who, who were all really into the process. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's a really, it, for me, it's one of the more valuable things. It's something that I always ask when I go into a new client's office, you know, like, what are you hiding? <laughs> um, so, next, be purposeful. 
about your measurement. Um, so here on the left, we have our quick like RSVP list, you know, and arrival times for some people. James Bond, always the latest one to arrive. Um, so this is, you know, it's a great chart of information, but what can you, what can you do with that aside from like make a checkbox next to somebody who arrived an event and you see that they have, you know, okay, you can get your count of how many people you need, you know, how many tables you need at, a, at something. But how do you actually take something like that, which I know you all have, and, um, and build it into a, co a data collection system that actually works for you? Well, I mean, let's break it, let's break it apart. In some ways, um, you know, James Bond might be fighting Mini-Me, <laughs> right? Um, so you'd have to, you could establish what, that, what the relationship is. You see that James Bond is coming at nine o'clock, which means, okay, you don't have to have one table ready at exactly at 8.45, you can have it ready at nine. I don't know, there's a lot of information that you can find from there. So it's kind of, it's some of the process is about breaking apart what you already track and what you already have into things that, that are more meaningful. Like, do you want to track relationships? Do you want to track where people work? Do you want to track what they're interested in? Do you want to track, like, you've got to ask yourself a lot of questions. And that's how you begin to build a data collection system because, it, you know, tools and data systems and, you know, databases are all great, but if you haven't figured out what's going to go in them first, they don't do anything for you. So, anyway, so it's just be purposeful about, about what you are trying to find out. Um, so, we've kind of gone through most of this. Clear means of measurement, what, um, so do you, um, one of the things that, uh, that, that Rem and Sean talked about this morning was transparency as well, and how that can be helpful. So as, you know, this boss learned that her, that her um, staff members were, um, were, didn't know what she was doing most of the time, she learned that being transparent with them was a really important and valuable lesson. So, you know, kind of putting it out all out there is a really, really um, important thing to do. Um, yeah, clear time, resource, cost of measurement, ability to collect data in real time. So all of, all of this is, is just about being realistic and what's possible. You know, you look around your staff, at, at your staff members and you're like, well, you know, we'd love to track how many people are female and live in this building complex and are, are unemployed, but do we actually realistically have the people power to, to track that information? And can we, you know, can we actually make it happen? Or can we only track that there are 500 females that live in this apartment complex? Um, so it's, you know, a, a really good piece of, of um, building a data collection system is it's just understanding what your resource requirements are and what your resource um, uh, limitations are. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so, how do you build enthusiasm <laughs> around collecting good data? Because um, you can collect a lot of data. Whether it's good or not is a whole other story. Um, good data is subjective in some ways because to one person, you know, the fact that there are 500 females living in this apartment complex could be good data, and to somebody else, they just care if there are 1,000 people living there. You know, so it's kind of understanding what good data is and defining it is one way to build some enthusiasm in the staff because, you know, you have to, you're probably, what I've experienced is sitting around the table with various clients and they have said things like, well, you know, we really want to track this, and we really want to track that, and we really want to do this. And so what has to happen is a collaboration of what the good data is and what is, um, you know, what is, is realistically possible. Once you've kind of gotten through that, then you're able to, um, you're able to kind of collaborate and talk with one another and, you know, understand what it is you're all trying to collect. Um, thinking in campaigns. So campaigns can mean different things to different people. There are political campaigns, <laughs> obviously. Um, there are uh, campaign. There are you know annual 
campaigns, annual you know, uh, fund campaigns where you're trying to raise money. There are campaigns that are lists for things. But if you think about it, um, each one of those campaigns means something. You know, if you're if you're creating a, um, you know, look at your yeah, look at your calendar. That's the biggest thing. If um, if you have a, a a one year period where you know that you do two annual fund campaigns and you do three big events and you do, you know, four other types of types of advocacy campaigns, something like that, then you can actually create a a list of all the things that are going to go into that, and that means kind of starting to break down your data. Like if you've got an annual fund campaign in February and, um, and a big event in the, in the fall, it's very possible that you want to invite all those people from the annual fund campaign to your big event in the fall. What happens in between? Do you keep track of them? Do you send them reminders about things? Do you send them information? How do you, who are they? And do you want to find out more about them with your annual fund campaign? So it's kind of, you know, Coming up with campaigns to link people together and link events together is a really good way of, of starting to collect more interesting information. Um, and also a good way to start building your database because if you can start to segment, then you build really good information. Okay, so after you've gone through this whole process of like breaking stuff down and talking to people and coming up with spreadsheets and building your plan, and you've put it into action and you've kind of used it for a while, it's always a good idea to go back and come up with a new plan <laughs> because that is exactly what is going on right now. Every, things have to change every six or eight months and so, and sometimes even shorter you know, time periods than that. So you're, you're gonna have to constantly review what you've been collecting, how you've been collecting it and where it's gonna go next. Um, and so talk about the next plan, agree on your next steps, and then you can achieve data liberation. <laughs> um, so then finally, after you've achieved all of these things, continual mon monitoring of what you've collected and where you've, what you've um, built, because it's the best way to figure out if, if what you're collecting is actually effective and going to achieve something for you. Um, and it kind of goes back to the, you know, to this, which is keep talking about your plan, whether it's working. Um, so I think that's it. Data, <laughs> planning, data, talking about data. <laughs> Are there any questions I say sheepishly? <laughs> Spreadsheets and stuff. Oh. I, I was just I saying know. that I could really relate to the secret spreadsheets and, and data, and uh, that's that's so common. Yeah, <laughs> it is right. I mean, yeah. ha everyone has it. Yeah, I even have it in my uh, my job, and we have like crazy cool databases. But I I keep my own spreadsheets. Yep. Me too. <laughs> I'm totally guilty of it. <laughs> yes. I think you have to wait for the mic. Oh, sorry. There. I have a clarifying question. Um, I, I guess I didn't quite understand what you meant when you said work down the data chain. And you had an arrow um, going counterintuitively, which I must have missed. Can you explain a little bit um, yep. how that process works? Yeah. So um, what we mean by that, and generally where, where we start to kind of dive into what people have and they collect is to see what they're, what, it's con it, it is a little counterintuitive, but we like to see what the end product is <coughs> before we can get to the beginning product. And so we kind of work our way backward. What are the reports you're trying to build? Um, especially when it comes to funders. Funders generally like to see things in a certain way with a certain number of columns and, and they like to see a certain, you know, like percentage or something like that. So working backwards from that, you know, what are the things that actually go into that? If it's, if your funder is asking you for something like, um, how many kids uh, were in your program that required school lunches? 
and they only just wanted the number, like 32, or whatever, you know, I'm bringing, I'm pulling out a number um, from the air. Well, how do you go from that 32? And then, so let's, if we, if we break it down, what data can we collect? Well, if you're a school program, you probably can collect the information about how many school lunches pretty easily. You probably get the roster with, a, you know, a line item on it. Um, what do we need to collect? That is school lunches, kids, probably gender, um, and maybe income situation. Um, what outcomes do you want to see? Well, in this case, it's not really outcome based. It's more, you know, what that 32 number is. Um, so I guess the 32 is the outcome. Um, it's, you know, what you just kind of drill through that. So for us, it's, it does seem counterintuitive, but it's, we, we reverse engineer. Does that help clarify at all, or am I? Yes. Um, I'll repeat the question, which was to give a practical example for um, something that can go all the way down the list. So, yeah. Um, we are working with an organization that was given a grant to work with 10 other organizations to build an outcomes management system. We're, we're building this in Salesforce. And um, so each organization was given uh, a certain amount of money to build their own database. So in that, um, they did they did the theory of change first. They went through a whole process, like a year and a half long process, where many of them changed their mission statements, changed what they were gathering. So in, in this case, I guess it, it is a little counterintuitive because they did the theory of change first. Um, and they what they discovered through their process was that they needed to, um, they needed to track specifically whether or not the youth were actually getting something out of their programs. Um, I'm not gonna go into specifics because there are a lot of organizations. So what the edict was, was we need to see a report of how many youth were, got through this program and you know, went to the next level in terms of their grade. Like they went from 11th to 12th grade instead of dropping out. And so in, for them, they needed to track what programs they were, like what after school programs they were involved in, what um, mentoring programs they were involved with, um, whether or not there was somebody that was meeting with them once or twice a week, something like that. And then um, the outcomes were that this student was doing much better. So yeah, maybe I could move those up, but I mean, that's, that's the most practical, I, I mean, I can come up with a lot of other practical examples of how to get there, but sometimes that, that data drives a new change in how your organization is working, and sometimes it starts it. Yes? About, about <coughs> you, you, had a, you had a demographic group and then a certain thing happened to them, is where we found the most valuable pieces in this and where this thing comes back around is because when you cross-reference the data, that's where you find the really valuable stuff. Yeah. So if you've got demographic data that's about those folks who are getting school lunches or the kids who are getting tutoring or whatever, and then you track what happens to them later, then you can go back and look at which groups had what kind of progress. And when you find that out, then you can go back and direct your services and, and your activities to, towards the things that need it the most. Yeah. <clears throat> that's where sometimes you don't know what that cross-referencing is going to get you when you start, which is so the piece you had about feedback is a yep. really important component because that's where you look at you look at the cross-references and you do data mining. <clears throat> so the more you don't you can't always tell what information is going to be most useful to you for that data mining process when you start. So you've got to speculate what it is, but you don't really know. It's when you really go back and do the cross-referencing that you find interesting stuff. Yeah, and sometimes you, you realize through your data mining that your program is, is not working. Yes, you have to change some it. components of it may be, right, not yeah. working. Anyone else? Yes. Oh. 
to wait for this. Hi there. Um, I think this is great because I feel like you've really tackled the on-the-ground problems uh, that nonprofits really, really are, are, are dealing with. This yeah. is great. You know, it's Thanks. a terrific overview. And um, I'm sitting here kind of with my background in social academic, social research headset on thinking, um, you know, there's a whole history of methodology in both qualitative and quantitative social research. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about bringing together academics who, you know, have to have their research um, threshed out in the peer review process and yeah. have worked out all kinds of methodologies and best practices? How would you bring um, the people who have that, you know, social research methodologies all day, every day, um, into this picture to help nonprofits. And just, what are your, what would, where would you go with that? Well, that's a, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question and it kind of speaks to what many nonprofits are going through these days, which is creating their logic models. And um, through the creation of a logic model, you have to go through a lot of academic and research-based information to get to, I, I wish I, there was this one great logic model that I, I meant to bring with me, but it was um, uh, really amazing. They, uh, you know, it kind of went through a whole bunch of tiers of things. And actually, uh, what the thing that I was just talking about with the 10 organizations, they went through um, this process of, in a very research and rigorous oriented way, they decided that each organization needed to work with a social services person and, and figure out how these outcomes are gonna best um, inform the programs that they create. Because the programs themselves needed to be, you know, kind of, they needed to be research-based and scientific-based as opposed to just, hey, I think, you know, we're gonna do this thing and see if it works. They really needed to, to get a specific outcome from the students, and so the, I think the, the best way to answer your question, I guess, is that it, a data collection system can be used to, to support something like that, um, but you always need the research up front in order to inform how the data collection system is gonna be used. Does that answer your question? I guess maybe another uh, another analogy that I use a lot is interfaith dialogue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that the day-to-day -day operations of a nonprofit um, have to be experienced to be believed. <laughs> Likewise, the academic snake pit. Oh, I didn't say that. Um, but the uh, you know the, what goes through you know the kind of peer-reviewed process. These are two really really different cultures, and I feel like yeah. academic researchers really would not have a clue about how things are really done, how goals are really achieved. Yeah. And yet would have such a handle on methods, you know, possible methods, and would know so much about, in terms of research methods, what blind alleys have already been explored and rejected and whatever. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking, does it make sense to try to explain to people who know a lot about research methodologies how things really get done well, so in an organization and then ask them to create um, things or vice versa, try to get academics to explain to the people sitting around that table creating a data-driven culture yeah. how you create valid and reliable, um, uh, re, you know, da how you derive valid and reliable results from data. Yeah, so, so. I think that's, I, I think earlier I said something about two different tools. Mm -hmm. There are research tools and then there are data tools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's about taking whatever that research tool that gets developed by the you know academics or the researchers has to somehow um, be talked through in order to system systematize it. Often research like that isn't necessarily um, adaptable in in the way that the researchers want. It's not necessarily adaptable to a technology tool, but there are ways to 
kind of glean from that type of information and create something that is practical. I think that's what you're, you're getting to. Yeah, and, and I, I'm just worried that, that on both sides we're going down blind alleys here. They, and, that they, and they probably are. It's, you know, it's kind of a new yeah, frontier and, and in terms of. It's possible to really get, you know, really identify what change you're trying to make and collect a lot of data and analyze mm -hmm. it and report it out in a really, really sexy infographic and still not be Help. showing causality. And still not be helping the, the, the yeah. people that you're and, trying to and serve. So, and some things, it's just, the reason you're not showing causality is it's really difficult. I mean, yeah. It's maybe impossible. It's still worth doing, but it's, it's really difficult and maybe impossible. And so, um, I guess, I, you know, I, I'm just kind of worried about it. I mean, I have enough training in, in social research methods to be dangerous and a quibbler, but I don't have enough to set everybody on the planet straight about this. But yeah. I feel like we should have some kind of program, you know, to have that dialogue and create something that would work there. Yeah. And um, since you're really kind of on the forefront, I'm just interested in, you know, how you would create that collaborative relationship. I, I, you know, it's it's a difficult question, but I think it has to do with what is being researched and what you want to measure and how it's going to be used in a practical, in a practical way. Mm -hmm. There, I think there are any number of things that we can we could work on. Yeah, to do that. I don't know is a valid answer. I mean, yeah. it's kind of a. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? One more question. No more questions. <coughs> I just think that change management around getting nonprofits to em embrace data-driven culture. It's not just top-down or ground-up. It's from the left and from the right and from uh, around the corner. And um, you know, we're three years into developing one tool that the entire agency can use in, you know, instead of nine different databases. And we still have some of the redundant databases, but we have yeah. more of a no wrong door policy. And, um, you know, I think people get convinced, um, and the more people that get convinced, the more effective it can be, but it, it's not a one-time thing. It's a constant thing. It's reinforcing yeah. it. It's having the new housing intern start and say, oh, this is really easy, and then you have the people from Head Start in 20 years that have not been using it start to see um, how effective it can be, and then they yep. grudgingly start using it. So it's not, it's not a linear thing at all. It isn't. Data is not linear in any way. 